I've been looking forward to getting a chance to talk to one of Canada's leading business people. I was thinking about the list of accolades for Frank Schuster is so long, we'd have no time for the actual interview here. So let me just say, this is a Hall of Famer in the business world, known internationally for his philanthropic works, but of course, uh, one of the icons of Canadian business here. And I'm very pleased to welcome him back to the show. Frank, thanks for finding time with me. Hey, my pleasure. Always my pleasure. You know what grabbed me here is, uh, you write for the Toronto Star, great for them, as you just did an article called Why Money Isn't Really Money Anymore. And boy, does that sing into the choir when you're looking at me. But it's the change in the monetary system that concerns me, the impact on individuals. So why do you say things like, you know, money just isn't what it used to be? It doesn't buy what it used to be mm -hmm. and used to rather and has a tremendous impact, especially the lower down you are in the income scale, which now I say has moved way up on the income scale into the middle class. Right. Well, I, I think that you first have to understand what money is supposed to be. And traditionally, money has been a uh, medium of exchange, a unit of account and a store of value. Uh, medium of exchange, you buy and sell stuff. A unit of account is a way to measure the value of what you're buying and a store of value, meaning that you can it holds its value over time. Um, for a whole host of reasons which we can get into, mostly all the money, excessive money printing that's taken place. Uh, over the last uh, decade and a half, um, it's lost both unit of account uh, uh, function and store of value function. The only function I see left that it has is a medium of exchange. Um, everything is mispriced because there's been so much funny money created. So you can't really say it's a unit of account anymore because everything's mispriced as a function of excess money supply. And uh, and a store of value, forget it, you know, as inflation starts yeah. to kick in, which it has, we had first a decade of asset inflation with after the 2008 financial crisis with all the money printing. So the rich got richer. Uh, asset prices went up because they were able to borrow money for no cost and buy all of the assets that they could possibly buy. Yeah. Uh, and then inflation has now kicked in into the consumer price index. We're seeing that the last year or so. And that, in my opinion, will continue. And as that inflation continues, the value of your purchasing power goes down. That's just simple math. And so uh, that, you know, it's it's really lost its uh, purchasing power. It's lost its trust and it's lost its there's not clear what function it has left. That's generally what money is. And I find that most people don't really understand what money is. They, you have to begin by understanding what it is and what your money in your bank account really, really means. And again, I, I find that most people don't understand what, what, what it means to have a deposit in a bank, what the banks actually do with that money and at the ratios they do it at <laughs> to create all of this credit. Um, you know, every time you deposit a dollar in your bank account, they can create $10 of new money. And so most money in, exi in existence is just credit. It doesn't exist. You know, of the, I think it's, uh, there's 14 trillion, trillion US dollars in circulation. Uh, if you measure it by M2 money supply, only 11% of that is really actual cash that you can stick in your mattress and hide it and hold it and see it's real. The rest is a digital illusion. That money does not exist. And people don't get that. And they will only find out when there is a major currency crisis, which happens at the end of super debt cycles, which we're at at the moment. We're at the end of a 70-year super debt cycle. And we're starting to see the cracks now of all of the bad behavior by central banks and policymakers in general. Well, it's it's interesting that everybody is feeling it. They may not understand why. I mean, look at the housing market and the complaints about lack of affordability there. Those are hard assets that have been bid up, you know, uh, you know, fueled by both central bank policy and, of course, uh, fiscal policy at the same time. But it's an example of people may not appreciate what's happened, but, man, are they ever feeling the impact of it. Uh, there's something you said there that I, you know, it's one of our Money Talks themes that uh, I'd love you to elaborate on is that, People don't understand that what this paper thing in their hand really is. You know, uh, like if I don't trust it, for example, there's nobody listening today who I've said, hey, by the way, we're not going to pay you in dollars anymore. We're going to pay you in dinara or something like that, <laughs> you know, or, or lira or whatever you go throughout the world. They'd understand that. No, I don't think I want that to happen. But it's that whole element of trust that's been eroded here. 
It's a belief system. And, you know, money in general, no matter what you use for money, whether it's seashells, gold, mm -hmm. uh, you know, rocks, you know, whatever has been used throughout, you know, the centuries, paper money, it, it, it's based on trust. You have, you as the holder of that money have to believe that it's worth something, that you can take it a great distance and use that same rock, seashell, paper, currency, gold, yeah. and it will be accepted. So it's a collective belief system that we've all bought into and it's based solely on trust. So what worries me is as the uh, policymakers, mostly the central banks, but also fiscal policymakers, continue to misbehave, to mistreat the value of that money uh, by creating huge amount of debt or printing huge amounts of money, it that trust system will erode. And sometimes it ends in a crisis that happens very suddenly. As you know, as yeah. Ernest Hemingway once described bankruptcy, he said, you know, how did it happen? He said, well, gradually and then suddenly. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what's happening here, right in front of our eyes. And most people kind of feel that there's something wrong, but they don't really understand the severity of the problem and how it could possibly come to a conclusion, which will, will be very painful for almost everybody. Everybody will get hurt. Obviously, a certain, you know, I think the middle class and the poor will get hurt the most because they have no assets to rely on. You know, if their whole wealth is their savings account or what have you, or bonds or T-bills, you know, they're going to get hurt. They're going to get hurt either because that, you know, banks will fail or because inflation will eat away at the value of that paper money. Is it your impression that, like, literally, my impression is that the politicians don't understand this. This is a, a much bigger game, a bigger understanding of credit, of monetary systems, that kind of thing. But do you think the central banks don't know well, that's the danger going on here? As you said, <laughs> this massive debt super cycle could blow up in our face. Yeah, and you know, my, I, yeah go ahead, sorry. please. No, I was going to say, Mike, like, I've written about this a lot over the last yeah. you know, 15 years, and I came to a simple conclusion. Central banks are not dumb. These are quite smart people, well-educated, but I believe they're complicit in the lie of what they're doing as a benefit to the general public. I think that mm. bank, central bankers are people from the banking industry. They, there's a revolving door between the major banks and the Federal Reserve, and they all toe the line while they're in power. The minute that they leave, if you take Greenspan and Bernanke, then they can criticize the actions of the central bank. While they're in power, they toe the line and they tell the big lie, which is, and their entire purpose is to anchor your inflation expectations. And they've more or mm -hmm. less admitted that. Anchoring means they make you believe that inflation will not go up, will not continue to rise, or it doesn't even exist at all, or it's understated. And they do that because inflation becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And they understand how inflation works. If you believe that the prices of th goods are going to go up, you're going to purchase before the price goes up and you fuel that price pressure for those goods to go up in price. And that's one of the key, ro the key ways in which inflation works. And they understand this very well. And they will tell you, as Bernanke said in 2000, whenever it was, 2011 or 12, you know, we can unwind the balance sheet. We, you know, we, we can, you know, get rates up to, you know, the balance sheet has mainly stayed in these high levels of close to $9 trillion. They try and bring it down and then another, another crisis happens yeah. and they have to print more money. And that will continue to be the reaction to every crisis that you will see going forward. Well, the reaction, as you've seen, and I'll go through. Here's the other thing. The frequency of crises over the last 20 yes. years is increasing. The intermittent periods in between of crises is shortening. You think about the dot-com crisis followed by 9-11, 2000, 2001. First time we saw a real effort to create easy money. That lasted more or less till 2008. Big crisis 2008 what do they do back to easy money policy but then they also start printing money 2019 you get the repo uh the repo yep. crisis 
2020, you get the pandemic crisis. 2021, you get the UK guilt crisis. 2022, uh, 2023, you've got the US banking crisis. And so every time these crises are becoming more and more frequent, and they're always addressed in the same manner, lower, you know, lower rates or print money or both. Okay. And so you keep adding fuel to this fire that, you know, eventually has to break and it will break at some point. You know, I'm surprised it's lasted this long. And, you know, you've got all of and the problem is you've got a, a world with over $300 trillion in debt that is at the end of a super cycle of debt, 70 year super cycle of debt. And they're running out of room for credit creation. They're, you know, and that's why I think we still remember when the, during the pandemic, they uh, took away the fractional 10% fractional reserve yep. limits on U.S. banks to zero. And they still haven't put them back up to 10%. That means credit creation, they're giving another boost to credit creation to keep the game going. So I, I honestly think that this is just one of these things that's going to end up uh, being a, it's going to end. And, and, and again, I don't know how it's going to end. I don't think anybody does, but it will be very painful, which, whichever way it ends. But well, just come back to a couple of points you make. I think it's important for people to understand how the frequency is increasing. I think I just think that's, you know, when you look past just the last couple of years, as you say, on Money Talks, we called the repo crisis, which was September 16th, 2019. Nobody wanted to lend money in the overnight markets. Hence interest rates. They said, well, uh, will you lend it to me if I pay you 4% or 6 or 8 And it eventually went to 10 Federal yeah. Reserve steps in. Um, as you said, then we had the UK uh, pension crisis in October. Uh, we've got the Japanese Central Bank right now uh, yeah, I forgot going after <laughs> with trillions to keep that. But as you say, the frequency is huge and the response zone, I think this is key to understand, this isn't changing. There's no indication whatsoever this will not continue to be the response yeah. when we have a crisis. And no, that I is... The value, 100%. the value. Yeah. So you, I, you, I just, mentioned, you mentioned the Bank of Japan. You know that they own 52% of the Japanese bond market, the Japanese yeah. Central Bank of Japan. And they own, uh, I think it's about 80% of the equity ETFs representing 7% yes. of the overall market. Now, they're at the extreme and they're going to they're gonna keep going until they blow up. They're, you know, they're, they're in this vicious cycle. And by the way, everybody else is right behind them at different, at different levels. Yes. But it's all, we're all going in the same direction. A key point, though, again, that, yes, we're on that road. It's just, you know, Zimbabwe may have got there first, you know, and then you just yeah. keep on going. The hundreds or over 100, 150 countries in this same dilemma where now it's really reached where the currency is basically not buying anything. And especially now you price commodities in U.S. dollars and you have to convert local currency, which is, you know, not worth very much to many people. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons that the world, that the rest of the world is looking for a global monetary restructuring, which I've been yes. writing about for a number of years. Yeah. Now. I predicted it some years ago, and I, you know, no one believed me. They thought, ah, oh, the U.S. dollar, it's fine. It can never be challenged, blah, 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 blah. Well, you're seeing what's happening with the BRICS nations and this meeting they just finished in South Africa the last couple of days, where they've just admitted, by the way, six new members, Saudi Arabia, Iran, U UAE, yep. Egypt, Argentina, and Ethiopia. So now it's gone from uh, the five plus six, it's 11, and there's 20 more applicants. They were going to represent, w with all of these applicants and these new members, they, they're going to represent 80% of the world's population. And what do they want? They want a restructuring of the global monetary system. They said it very loudly, very clearly. We're not sure how they're going to get there. I can give you a number of scenarios, which I've written about, but we're going through a de-dollarization by the non Western countries by, you know, U.S., Europe, Canada, mm -hmm. Australia, Japan, South Korea, that's the West. And everybody else wants a change because they don't want commodities traded in U.S. dollars. They don't want to issue their sovereign debt in U.S. dollars because it hurts. It hurts them. It's inefficient. It's great for the U.S. because the U.S. can use its all this printed money that it can print endlessly um, to keep its inflation down, you know, the cost of imports are going to be cheaper if you're, if you've got a, a very strong currency, but the rest of the world is hurting and yeah. they don't like it. And so the Chinese have seen the opportunity since the invasion of Ukraine by Russia and the subsequent you know, sanctions that follow the, you know, the freezing of Russian assets, the elimination from the SWIFT uh, currency settlement system. And they're going, well, <laughs> 
we don't want to be part of that anymore. So now China is using that opportunity to encourage the rest of the world to find different approaches to settling uh, trade between nations. And I, you know, again, I don't know how much time we have on this call, but I've written a lot about it. You can go to frankjuster.com and I can show you all of the ways in which this de-dollarization is taking place. And that in the long term is going to have very serious consequences for the West because it will mean much higher inflation, higher interest rates, um, and a lower standard of living. Mm -hmm. You know, we've lived off of all of this, um, uh, you know, this fake money for so long that, you know, we think that we deserve it. And, you know, the rest of the world, world is going, no, you know, we've been hurting because of it. So they want to change. So that change will happen. It might happen quickly. It might take a decade, but it's happening. You know, one of the themes we've had on Money Talks is that we're in a monetary crisis. Um, what I've been thinking is that all of those things you've, you've, you've just alluded to, but I'm, I think that results in a new monetary system. Now, that's just a guess, as you say, sitting right here today. I'm looking out five, six years. Uh, that's where you might get digital currencies. But I'm not so sure it's just the U.S. dollar that goes in decline, but all paper currencies go into disrepute, and that produces a new sort of monetary system, which you've written about, but it might be, uh, you know, uh, a, sh a foreshadowing might be what's going on with digital currencies or the hope for yeah, digital Yeah, but I don't currencies. think digital currencies answers the, the it doesn't mm -hmm. answer the problem. I mean, first of all, it's it, uh, it's, it's inherent to man's nature to, nature to destroy paper currencies. They've done it every single yeah. time throughout the century. So all paper currencies eventually go to zero, all of them. And, you know, yeah. and the, today's paper currencies are no different. They get inflated away or they get destroyed one way or another. And, you know, the only remaining things are, are hard assets. Um, but, uh, and you know, and so you have to really think about that when you're planning long term, you know, what to do with your wealth. Um, because if you're, you know, if you're only invested in paper currencies or their derivatives and, you know, treasuries, bonds, what yes, have you, right. you're going to get killed. And and as we've seen lots of signs of this, one of the things that, of course, uh, people become Western centric, or at least we're in Canada. We think about Canada, the U.S., West Europe, uh, which has its problems along exactly what you're suggesting. But you look around the rest of the world and there's severe problems. But that brings me to uh, what you've just alluded to, and that's individuals sit there and they feel overwhelmed. They say, well, my God, what should I do? Because, I mean, look at how many people were hurt in the bond market in the last year, like dramatically hurt in exactly the way mm -hmm. you described with Hemingway. It starts slowly, then all of a sudden, well, come on, the rise in interest rates has been a pretty good all of a sudden, which of course meant everybody who, I look at the 10 year US bond, anybody who's bought it in the last 16 years or whatever it is, is underwater with that. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, at, to your point, but the question everybody seems to have once they start understanding what you've been writing about is okay what do i do well that's the million dollar question yeah and there are so many variables michael that it's absolutely impossible to predict a certain outcome there's a probability of different yes. outcomes and that's what you have to look at is where the probability wave goes and you have to Focus on that because anything can happen, but certain things yeah. are probable that will happen. <clears throat> you might get hyperinflation or you might get a depression or both. Um, and they're two opposite scenarios, right? You get hyperinflation, you know, you want to own assets because they're going to go up in value. You don't want to own paper currencies. Depression, deflation, you want to have lots of cash to buy the assets as they, they're going down in value. So, um, you know, I, I, I think the only thing I've come to the conclusion lately that, you know, as Yogi Berra said, nobody knows nothing. And that yeah. is absolutely true. Nobody knows nothing because we don't know what's going to happen. So what do I do? I play defensive. That's the mm -hmm. only thing you can do is to be defensive. This is not the time to be bold and to take the kind of risks that we've seen displayed the last few years since the pandemic, you know, this craziness in the marketplace of stocks, tech stocks, and uh, yes cryptocurrencies and nfts and metaverse real estate that was insanity okay absolute yeah. insanity and you know now we're slowly coming back to earth and there will be a crisis of some kind unfolding so diversification number one geographical diversification 
asset class diversification, I'm skewed towards hard assets, okay? Because I truly believe in the destruct that we're going to see a destruction of currencies, okay? And, and the value of those currencies. So hard assets, what are they? They're gold, they're real estate, they're art collectibles, farmland, certain things that are tangible and scarce in supply. That's what you have to focus on. Now, you mentioned the uh, central bank digital currencies, which apparently there's about 114 countries that are testing or pilot yeah. testing or looking into creating their own digital currencies. But that doesn't mean anything. They can treat central bank digital currencies as they treat current fiat yes. currencies. There's no limit on how much they can create if they need to. Now, obviously, they're not going to start out that way, but they have the power to change the rules. And, and you know, I just think that I, I don't like the idea of central bank digital currencies. I think it gives way too much power to the central banks. Yeah. And they will use it eventually to influence your behavior. They will punish or reward you for certain types of spending behavior or investing behavior. And, you know, they're taking away all the power from the individual. And I think that that's a really, really bad idea. And I'm with you completely on that. Uh, what I want to come back to something you said, because, again, it's people should be aware of this. There's no, no examples of paper currencies ever lasting. I mean, they've all gone to nothing and, uh, you know, they, they've disappeared, et cetera. And I just think you think we're going to be the first to buck the trend the way we're spending, the way we got physical and monetary policy. It's our fiscal. I mean, no. No, no. But I think that's, again, one of those things that people sort of go, really? Not one of them? Nope. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you, know? Just do, it, you know, not enough people read history books. I wish more yeah. people read history books. Everything you're seeing today has happened before. These patterns are all the same throughout the centuries. The only thing that's changed is technology. Mm -hmm. Everything, human behavior has not changed. And you watch, you can chart it over the centuries. Ray Dalio did a great piece. I don't know if you read his book uh, about the, you know, the, uh, I can't remember, the, uh, it was whatever it's called. It's about the world, the, ch the changing world order. That was called. Yes. Read that book. He does an exquisite job of charting every powerful nation's rise and decline over the last five centuries. And it's always the same pattern. We, you know, we're all sitting here today because our entire lives, we've worked, lived in a system where it hasn't failed. So that's all we know. So we can't possibly imagine that it's going to fail because it's always worked throughout our lifetimes. Well, you know, math, you can't defy math. Math yeah. eventually catches up with you. And, you know, all of the weight of all of this debt and all this money printing, gravity will take hold. And so that's just, it's a question of time and it's a question of how it unfolds, but it will unfold and it's going to be very painful. And, and back to what you said, I mean, this is why I think people have to diversify, understand, as you say, there's many scenarios that can play out and prepare for them. But I love your comment that you're defensive. I, I am yeah. too, by the way, because I appreciate that if it moves against you, it's going to be violent. You know, yeah, it's going to it'll be, be violent. And usually it, yeah. and when you least expect it, you know, it's like everything's yeah. wonderful. And then one day you wake up and it isn't. And yeah. and everybody goes, oh, my God, what happened? Well, it's, you know, you've got $300 trillion worth of debt. Governments are loaded up to the eyeballs with debt. And rates have been jacked up to 5%. <laughs> Things will break. And they're going to continue to break until something major breaks. And when you lose the confidence, when people lose the confidence of their domestic currency, that's when you get hyperinflation. Exactly. And that's what people, uh, this is the point that I love that you're making because people think you just print up money, you'll get hyperinflation. No, it's the confidence is the key variable. We're seeing it unravel throughout parts of the world. And your message is very clear. We've got to protect ourselves. Yeah. Uh, hey, this Michael, is going to be, yeah. I'll tell you a great story. I grew up in Argentina. I was in Argentina until yeah. I was uh, nine years old and we moved to Canada. Um, my father saw the writing on the wall in Argentina, things starting to fall apart, and he moved us, he wisely moved us out before the poop hit the fan. And yep. we came here in 1966. Um, and he had invested uh, in a couple of businesses there, which he tried to sell and unwind, got into a few lawsuits. And by the time he collected his money, hyperinflation had set in, and he got that much zero. Yeah. The, the, he was paid back eventually, but that money he was paid back with had gone through a hyperinflationary period, and it was worth 
nothing, absolutely nothing. Well, as I say, I think this is the key financial issue for individuals, for countries too, but it'll drill down as we've already been feeling it for individuals. That's why I encourage people to go to Frank underscore Justra on Twitter. Frank underscore Justra spelled G-I-U-S-T-R-A. Frank underscore Justra, but you can find him in a lot of places. And, and Michael, include- also, uh, most of all my articles, whether they were originally mm-hmm. printed for the Toronto Star or, or other publications I've wrote, are on my blog which is frankjustra.com. Um, and there you can see everything I've written about this stuff over the last number of years. Um, and it's, you know, I, I, you know, I don't pull punches. I, I no. see this coming and, and I talk about it. But you've got the incredible background to do that, the personal business experience, investing experience, et cetera, and historical perspective, as you said, which is missing far too often. And yeah. I would really encourage people to do that. Uh, frankjustra.com. Again, one more time, Justra, G I U. S-T-R-A. Frank, thanks so much for finding time. I hope we can visit again in the near future. Michael, it's always a pleasure to be on your show. Let me just say one other thing about Frank is, uh, you know, Frank is doing charitable work. Well, it's throughout the world, but in Canada too. And I, I want to, he doesn't like it if I do this, but I'm going to do it because we need to help with Special Olympics. I gave Frank a call and man, did they deliver. And uh, so just a big thank you about uh, to Frank. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, Michael.